just switched over to 905. You ready, Brian? Ready. Okay. So my name's Tom Eager. I've been teaching this course for, in one form or another, for about 25 or 30 years. It goes by, in course three, two numbers. The graduate version is 3371, and the undergraduate is 3171. If you're taking it in mechanical engineering, it has a mechanical engineering number uh, as a J course. Um, I actually came to MIT 50 years ago this month as a freshman. Okay, so it's a big anniversary. You don't have to do a cake or anything. It's all right. Um, the uh, course is ostensibly about structural materials, but in fact, that's not really what it's about. Um, it's more of a course on whatever I want to talk about. Okay, when you get to be my age, you can do whatever you want. Okay, just ignore the administration and things like that. Uh, but it does have some modules that have to do with structural materials. So if you're interested in structural materials, you can get what you want um, out of the course. There were, in the spring, two co-lecturers. Simone Belmar is a graduate of this department. Um, uh, he has his own consulting company now. And Steve Lyons is a graduate of the Sloan School. He's a practicing attorney in downtown Boston. Um, in the spring semester, he lectures, uh, he's lectured three times on intellectual property law. He thinks that anybody who um, goes to MIT, it's going to, good chance some of them are going to be involved in some sort of startups or uh, some business and they should know something about intellectual property law. Good point. In fact, we're going to try to get that uh, course switched over from being a module in this course to actually a a full-fledged course over at the Sloan School because the Sloan students have appreciated what Steve had to talk about. Um, some of the administrative details, there's a sign-up sheet going around um, or you can contact my assistant uh, down the hall. Um, the students have really turned this into an online class. Uh, I teach at 9 o'clock in the morning because I tend to get in at 7 a.m. I tend to go home at 2 p.m. Um, to avoid traffic, mostly. Um, <clears throat> but there are students, as you can see, from four or five different departments. Uh, and about the only time, I actually did an analysis one year of what, was, what time would fit for everybody. The only hour in the week that would fit for all the students from all the different classes, undergraduate and graduate, was 4 o'clock on a Friday afternoon. No thank you. I was not going to lecture then. Uh, so, in fact, about 30 years ago, uh, maybe a little over 25, I actually taught the first uh, distance education course at MIT. It was an experiment where MIT gave credit. Uh, and it was distance education to students at General Motors. We videotaped the class. Uh, and I had 13 or 15 students at General Motors. And they, General Motors was paying tuition and for them. And, they were getting credit um, as special students at MIT, but they could use that. GM had programs. They could either get a master's degree at Rensselaer Polytechnic or Purdue University because they had programs with those universities. But they wanted a welding course. And my specialty for getting my tenure and stuff was welding. And they said, would Tom Eager teach a welding course? Well, I was teaching a welding course. So we, we videotaped it, and I learned that the students never asked questions. You know, I never got questions. I wanted the students who were watching this by video to ask questions because this was, they were taking it, delayed video, and I thought, I'd, how am I going to get feedback from the class? They weren't asked. I got like two or three questions in the first half of the semester, and then General Motors flew me out to Detroit to meet with a lot of the students. I said, how come you don't ask questions? So they said, well, you know, if we don't understand something, we just play the tape back uh, over that portion again, and it usually makes more sense the second time. Well, it turns out Stanford University in the, in the 1980s learned the same thing before MIT. They called it tutored video instruction, and they had students in different parts of the country that had a tutor um, that would play the video at the company site. We didn't have you know, real-time internet access back in the 80s. 
And they actually found the students who took it by tutored video instruction did better than the students who took it live. And it was partly because you can play it back. And it's not that the professors are always incoherent. It's that when you're watching something live, you, sometimes your mind wanders off to something else, like a Snickers bar or something like that, whatever. And, um, and you miss part of it. Uh, and so I thought, well, that's, that's interesting. And then I found that students would come to me and say, oh, professor, I can't, I can't be at class on such and such a day. I said, well, fine, you can watch the movie, OK, because we were videotaping. And we did that for one or two years with General Motors. And after that, I decided I pay for the videotaping myself for the last 25 years. Uh, because if you can't make it to class, you can watch the movie. And over time, with the internet and things, we now download these two things to YouTube. And there are 150 hours of me on YouTube, OK? And you get to take whatever 150 hours you want as long as you take 36 of them, OK? So that's how it evolved. Um, and the students have really turned it into an online class because of scheduling problems. We've decided over the last couple of years, not, not every semester, but to flip the lectures. Anybody know what flip the lectures means? You don't have to come to lecture because you can watch the movie. Just log into YouTube, watch it at your leisure. My favorite response from a student was they used to watch my lectures while they fixed dinner. Okay, uh, So you can multitask or whatever. And we'll have recitations alone this semester because you're going to find we have lots and lots of lectures you can watch. The recitations are going to be not Monday at 9 o'clock in this classroom. <clears throat> next Monday, <clears throat> I'll do one. Dr. Belmar will do one the next week. And we'll alternate for the first four weeks. And we'll let you know what our schedules are after that. The other thing is I try to compress this course into the first half of the semester, mostly. Uh, you actually have till the end of the semester, but if you're, if you're smart, you will get rid of this class early on and have the rest of your time for the other classes to get busy later. Uh, so it says schedule Monday, Wednesday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. That should be changed to just Monday. Um, and your student papers will be in November, uh, which is one of the five requirements. And I'll get to that in a second. Anybody have any questions? So I liked, I coined the term flexibility in a stress-free environment. You know, the administration is worried about all the stress on the students. In fact, Paul Gray, who was president of MIT all through the 1980s, when he retired as president, he said the one thing, one of his big disappointments in being president is he had not reduced the pace and pressure of MIT. Well, some of us would say, well, but the pace and pressure of MIT is part of MIT, OK? You know, drinking from a fire hose and things like that. And there's nothing wrong with learning to work hard, but there is something wrong with toiling and not learning anything while you're working hard, OK? And there's lots of times when people <clears throat> give you assignments that are for the sake of giving an assignment. And um, anyway, I'll get to that in a little bit. Any questions yet? Now, there's a number of available modules. They are originally 12-unit modules. In order to pass um, for a 12-unit class, you're supposed to have about 36 lectures, OK, if you go look at any other course that meets three times a week. Um, well, you should take 36 lectures. Uh, and they used to be, like fusion welding is a double module, it's now 12 lectures. And actually, these are my old welding courses, and there's 12 lectures each. There's 36 weld, uh, 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 lectures in welding. And it turns out the Navy students during the summer in the 2N program actually are required to take this. The Naval Sea Systems Command says if you're going to build ships, you need to learn how to weld. Uh, and well, they won't learn, won't learn that from my class. Anyway, they'll learn <coughs> the science of welding. So, but there's material selection, which has a lot to do with 
uh, structural materials. Last semester, I taught what is total quality management. Why? Well, like I said, I teach whatever I want, but a lot of these things are turning into a textbook that will be on what engineering is all about, okay? Uh, um, in fact, there is one called What is Engineering? Brian Haslam is here videotaping today. I don't know if we're going to videotape uh, the recitations. If someone wants to learn how to videotape, it's not that hard. Would you have to get here 10 minutes earlier, Brian, to set up? Uh, if anyone wants to videotape the recitations, if you can be here on Monday, I'll pay you 50 bucks an hour. Uh, in class, out of class, it's basically 75 or 100 bucks a day. Uh, so let Brian or myself know. And there's only going to be about half a dozen or so, but you can make four or five hundred dollars uh, by doing the videotaping, and Brian can show you how that's that's done. Um, but his wife is due any time now, so you have to talk to him soon. Uh, anyway, um, so those are some of the modules that I've put up. If you go to eager.mit.edu, you'll find all of them and a little more discussion about the modules. Um, there are some modules by Dr. Belmar over the last five or six years, mostly on uh, environmental and mechanical behavior. Last spring, he taught one on how to start a business uh, because he started his own business and he got an NSF grant and NSF has a program that is not typical NSF, but they teach you what you need to do and what the pitfalls are in running, uh, starting your own business. Turns out, uh, Dr. Neil Jenkins, Neil was an undergraduate here, finished his PhD here, then he went to medical school. And the year I was on sabbatical, he taught a module on non-destructive evaluation of the human body. So he's a medical doctor. He basically t talks about, if you're interested in medicine or biology, what a doctor looks at when you go in for a checkup. And it turns out I sat through all those while I was on my sabbatical. But basically, it's the five senses. Taste, touch, sight, sound, or whatever. What's the other one? Feet, taste, touch, sight, sound, and smell, OK? Some diseases have a unique smell, OK? Anyway, but it's actually fairly, <coughs> fairly interesting. Um, uh, Neil does, did that one. And then Steve Lyons, this practicing attorney, he's not just a practicing attorney, he's, he's the Lyons of Kleinman and Lyons, and he typically argues cases before the U.S. Supreme Court about once every year or two. So he's a fairly um, prominent intellectual property lawyer. He's a graduate of the Sloan School, and he, as an alum, just would like to give back some of the things that he learned uh, to the students. So it's a very practical type of course, okay? Um, where did that one come from? That looks like the same one. Uh, I'm going the wrong direction, that's why. Okay. Um, what are the requirements for the students? You've got to watch 36 lectures. Uh, we're not having them live this semester. We're having recitations, which do not count as part of the 36 uh, lectures. Um, the, that's usually in six modules. What happened is I was doing 12 unit modules, 12 lecture modules. And then uh, it turns out the students in online courses like briefer modules. So at least for my courses, Brian and, and Neil and some other people got together and sort of like they took a deck of cards, all my lectures, and they shuffled them, okay? And then they put them back together. Uh, so what's online now, you might have a lecture from 2013 with a lecture from 2015. It just shows that whatever I talk about, it doesn't really matter what order you take it, <laughs> okay? Uh, it's not, not important. But you can go to the website and you should pick out what you're interested in. You need to prepare a one-page outline of each, not a one-page outline, of each lecture module. So that's going to be six pages, and it only has to be one or two lines describing the two or three themes of that lecture. 
Okay, now, how did I survive MIT? I came here 50 years ago. I found out about this week, 50 years ago, I was in the bottom third of my intern class. They got all the freshmen together in Kresge, and they said, uh, we used to say, um, look to your right, look to your left. One of the three of you won't be here next year. Ha, 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 ha. And they said, we don't say that anymore. But then they flashed up the college board scores and all this other stuff, statistics of my class. And I was smart enough to realize I was in the bottom third. I thought I was hot stuff because in my high school, if I couldn't solve the math problem, nobody could, including the teachers. Okay? I got here, I thought I was going to be a math major. That lasted for two weeks. Okay? One of the things at MIT, you kind of, you're forced to learn a little humility because there's always someone better. Okay? And so you don't compare yourself with yourself. In fact, there's a, a handout, should be on Stellar, something I wrote about 12 or 15 years ago after 30 some years at MIT, which is my description of what makes MIT unique as a university. It's called Leadership Management and Education at MIT. It's only a couple of pages long. Um, it's on the West Stellar website, and I would encourage you to, to read it. A lot of my classmates and some faculty have told me it's the best article I ever read in the faculty newsletter. Well, that's not saying much, okay, if you read the faculty newsletter. But, but in fact, um, many of them said, well, it, it really brought back what they remembered of their MIT education. After all, I haven't gotten out of here for 50 years. Um, so the one page, the one or two line outline, <coughs> what happened is in my junior year, I took an elective course in physics called Introduction to Quantum Mechanics, taught by Vera Kistiakowsky. She was the first tenured woman faculty member in physics at MIT. Her father had won the Nobel Prize at Harvard in chemistry. Brilliant. Always brought her big German Shepherd to class. Uh, I had no clue what was going on in that class. I always get 15s out of 100 when class average was 85. And so the night before the final, I figured I was going to flunk this course. I didn't understand quantum mechanics. I didn't, I didn't know what was going on. So I took the book, and I decided, well, I'm just going to go through and try to pick up what the high points are. Went into that final. Three-hour final, finished it an hour and 20 minutes, checked it over another 20 minutes, walked out of the class, and got an A in the class. Okay? And when I got that grade in January, all of a sudden I said, Oh, you mean all this other stuff they teach you is just fluff? All you have to do is understand the high points? The professors cover 10 times what you need to know. And if you can just figure out, I used to call it, guess my lecture. They have something they want to teach you, but there's only two or three concepts in an hour that they can really get across. And if you can figure out what those are. So for the rest of my career, the rest of my junior year, my senior year, my graduate career at MIT, I never took notes anymore. You don't have to take notes in this class. What are you going to take notes on? You're not going to have quizzes. You're going to find out, OK? Just sit there and try to learn. Try to figure out what the professor's talking about. And you could take some notes, because at the end, I want you to write down one or two lines of what you got out of that lecture. OK? Well, you're going to find that I teach basically in stories. You can call them parables. Brian went through and found out the last, what, four years, I've told 551 stories in my lectures. OK? Yeah. OK? So. More than four years. OK, five or six years, whatever. But he had to watch them all. Gee. Um, but in any case, I tell stories. Because I thought back, what do I remember from my freshman year? I remember the stories. I don't remember what they taught me. OK, I, I learned about the Bohr atom, and I learned about Miller indices. And I, who knows? I mean, you know, but I remember the stories. So I prefer to teach in stories. Um, and hopefully, well, I think the students in general think they're interesting stories. Even my own children think some of them are interesting. Although my daughter, Anna, always says, well, Dad, you already told me that one. Come on, Anna, I don't have an infinite number of stories. Uh, anyway, you have to, well, the other thing about, I, w I would like you to learn how to analyze at the end of a 50-minute lecture 
what were the one or two points? And the interesting thing to me, since we've been doing this for a few years, I can read what one student wrote from a module, then I read what another student wrote from the same lectures from a module. You wouldn't believe they had anything to do with any, you know, the same, same module. Because each person takes the stories and the lessons from the story based on what their own experience. Okay? It doesn't really matter what you write down. It's the process of learning to stop at the end and do a sort of an evaluation. What was this person trying to get across? And I quit studying for quizzes for the last three years of my career. Okay, I just go in there and wing it. You've got to prepare a 10-page paper on a materials topic of your choice. Okay, we'll go through that in a little bit more detail. Um, and you've got to review or edit three or four other student papers. We will, we're going to ask you to tell us what your topic is in a few weeks um, uh, so that we can group them and you'll probably talk, you'll, well, try to group them in a way that they sort of have common interest. Um, Ten pages maximum of text plus additional figures or tables, whatever you want. But I don't want to read anything longer than that. You don't want to have to write anything. In fact, it's actually harder to write the short 10-page thing than it is to type, write the 30-page thing. You can just ramble on. I read these undergraduate lab reports. Oh, you know, just how I spent my minute in the lab, OK? My minutes in the lab, minute by minute, OK? First, we opened the door. Then we let the door close. But we made sure no one was in the way. OK, <clears throat> anyway. Um, you should have some reference sources. This is an MIT course. We should know that it's just not you talking about something. And it's nice if you give me a, a little biography of where you grew up and how you got to MIT and things like that. Okay. Uh, potential topics. This really doesn't have much to do anything. Uh, when I originally put this together a few years ago, I said, well, you could take an element and just study the element. Well, no one's done that. You could look at commodities like steel, aluminum, or concrete, and there's all kinds of information on the um, National uh, Geo. There's a federal agency that basically does studies, and you can on these markets, okay, commodity markets. You could take a technology. You can, one student did Japanese swordsmithing. In fact, they used to have a little display in the hallway of these students who had made a Japanese sword on, the, on their own. Uh, some students have done the HMS Titanic. Some students from nuclear engineering have done power, nuclear power plants. Uh, a couple of students one year both did pole vaulting. They were both the pole vaulters at MIT. Turns out a pole, a pole for a pole vaulting, you ever seen them? They bend more than 180 degrees and they don't break. It's because it's a composite material that's layered and has variable stiffness, OK? But anyway, it's actually a very interesting uh, technology. Or make a proposal for anything you want. I don't really <clears throat> care what it is. The, for me, the primary requirement is you pick a topic you're interested in. Because you'll do a better job if you're interested. OK? I'm not going to assign you to do something that you don't care about. In fact, I've had some students, I don't want to see your thesis. Because unless you can make it down 10 pages <laughs> completely. But I don't care if you tell me about your thesis. OK? It's something you've already worked on. Hopefully, you're interested in your thesis, OK? <clears throat> I, but, and I don't want something off the internet, OK? We have had a couple of students that I had to determine, uh, and they were pretty good search engines. Not this Brian, but there's another Brian Holman who's out this week. Uh, Brian's pretty good about tracking down and saying, well, you know, they got everything from two sources. And one of them was Wikipedia. OK, we don't particularly like that. We actually want your thoughts, OK? So <clears throat> any materials topic you wish. Talk about something you're interested in. 10 pages double spaced, OK? At least 10 point, if not 12 point font, OK? None of this six point font, OK? Um, don't be too general. I don't want to know how to build an automobile. It's a bit general, 
okay? Um, or too broad. Um, they used to, one of the jokes used to be when I was a student, the MIT final exam, define the universe and give three examples. That's your three hour final, okay? Uh, it's a little broad. Oops, what did they do? Went back to the beginning. Um, uh, so, <clears throat> so don't try to cover too much. I mean, things, the pole vault pole and how it's made was fine. I don't need to know the history of pole vaulting and who won the last, last 16 Olympics or something. Um, unless your topic is who won the last 16 Olympics and how pole vaulting technique has changed over the last 16 years, but, or 64 years, whatever, if it's 16 Olympics. Um, I would like you to tell me something about what you think, okay? Uh, I teach these Navy students during the summer. I don't know how many times I've had the Thresher disaster or the British uh, carrier the Sheffield in the Falkland Islands War. And the, the variations on those themes, I mean, it's all the Thresher disaster, the submarine sank off Cape Cod, which was a major um, catharsis for the U.S. Navy. They basically shut down submarine production for three years. Uh, and the Navy instituted a new program, uh, which they called SubSafe, which actually is the beginning of total quality management. The Navy did it in the 60s. American industry picked it up. In the, in the 90s, uh, the Japanese picked it up in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. But it was actually developed because of the Thresher disaster. The Sheffield, the Sheffield got hit by an Exocet mi missile in the Argentine-British War over the Falkland Islands. And this one little missile destroyed the whole ship because the aluminum superstructure caught fire and just became a great big flare, okay? Um, and so the question is, did that really happen or not? I mean, there's still debate about it, okay? Um, and so you can, have a, you can have a theory after studying something. Um, let's skip the, that. So what is the grading? What are the five requirements? First requirement, no quizzes, no finals, no tests. Yay, okay. I so told you it was flexibility in a stress-free environment. Um, what I've learned over the years is when I was lecturing courses like thermodynamics and there was a quiz the next day, I had to make sure I covered certain things. So if a student asked a question that wasn't going to give me time, I would sort of ignore their question and just cover the things that everyone needed for the quiz the next day. You know, that's not the way to teach, okay? So I hated three-hour finals as a student. I used to not take courses that had three-hour finals. Okay? Even if it was something I was interested in, I wouldn't take the course because I hated three-hour finals. Um, there's no quizzes and no tests. Don't worry about it. Okay? That's why you don't have to take notes. You don't have to remember anything in this course. That was something I learned my first year as a faculty member. I had a little notebook, and I would, I would put things down in that notebook. And then about nine months later, I realized I never had time to go back and read the notebook, so I decided Quit taking notes. If I can't remember, it's not important. And so people are shocked now. I still don't take notes, okay? I wouldn't say I've never taken a note, but I don't take a lot of notes, okay? Uh, the submission of your proposed topic, that's due in a couple of weeks. Once that 21st is a Friday, just we'll have something on Stellar. You can tell us in one third of a page or half a page what your topic is. We will read it, and if we think it's too broad or too general or uh, it's not usually too difficult, although I picked one of those once as a freshman. Um, um, there's no problem with collusion with others. I'm supposed to talk to you about, you know, can you cheat? You can cheat all you want in this class because there's no quizzes, no finals. You know, it's, cheating is, well, cheating is not a proof, but collusion is you can talk to other people all you want. Um, your paper is going to be due on October 26th. That's, less, that's six weeks from now, folks. I told you I'm going to try to compress this. You don't have to finish watching your 36 modules by October 26th, but I don't want your paper because what we're going to do is um, 
That should be 1126. Sorry about that. I'll have to change that. A month later, we want, we're going to give these, your paper, to other students to have them peer review it, okay, and make suggestions. That doesn't mean they rewrite it. It just means they read it and they make comments on what they didn't understand. And I'm sorry for that error. That's, that's a month later, 1126. Uh, it just so happens, uh, well, I make typos. Okay. Your final paper is due, which means after you've gotten their comments, you've got about two weeks to make the edits, make the changes, and submit it. Okay? So if you really look at it from when you finish your paper on 1026, if you've already done your 36 modules, what do you have to do? You have to read three or four other papers and make some comments, and then you have to edit, take their comments on your paper. That's all you have to do for the second half of the semester, if you are diligent. And you can do the 36 units before Halloween, okay? If you just did one a day, okay? Most of you eat dinner, so while you're fixing dinner, just... Actually, I was, <laughs> I was going to my car yesterday, and one of the Navy students who was walking up had a baseball cap on. I didn't recognize him, but he was walking with a little three or four-year-old girl. And so he came up and said, I'm, I'm one of your Navy students. So he took his cap off so I could recognize him. And he had his daughter. He says, and she watched some of your, your lectures with me. He's got, he says, I have a picture of her on my lap while he was watching the movies. She's probably the youngest student in my class, OK? Um, but in fact, I've had some people who did not even have, go to college. I've had philosophy majors take this class. Um, completion of one page outlines of the modules. You could do that back in October if you want. But in fact, in between here, I need those sheets. And it'd be best when you do a module, just turn it in. We'll have a place on Stellar, and you can turn in your little one page. When I say one page, it can be a half page. I just want your bullet point summary of the one or two points or three points that were in the lecture. OK? Um, Many students will say they learned a lot from other students' papers. Okay, any questions? Yeah? Um, so is it one page per module or one page per lecture? Per module. Six, six, six lectures in a module. If you do one or two lines on each module, you got 12 lines, half a page. Okay? And so you can, put on, you can submit it six times. If you do a double module, you can put 12 on one page. Okay? Uh, but it's not supposed to be over. It's supposed to be for you to learn how to summarize after a lecture what it was you learned. What are the high points? Okay, other questions? That question comes up every year, right? <laughs> anyway, um, so let's talk a little bit about my teaching philosophy. And frankly, um, Dr. Belmar and, and Mr. Lyons have sort of picked up um, on my teaching philosophy. Um, Dr. Belmar's been teaching part of this course with me for five or six years, and he's gotten to the point where instead of coming in and giving lectures, which is what he learned, to, you know, you, you copy what you see other people do, that's how he started lecturing, and it turns out he now tries to come in with his stories, okay? And Steve Lyons came in, boy, he had he had all these PowerPoints that kind of went through all the points about intellectual property law and things he wanted to make, very organized. And he would come in and watch uh, Simone and myself lecture. And, and in the student evaluations and stuff, he says, well, how can I do better? I said, well, Steve, when you've told stories, don't you see how they really like them? Okay, they pay more attention. Well, he's gotten to the point where he teach, you know, he teaches by stories. So, all of us are sort of teaching by stories. Um, but my philosophy is too much of our educational approach is geared towards preparing students to take tests. And let's face it, you're MIT students. You don't need to learn how to take a test. Now, how did I figure this out? About 20 or 25 years ago, I kind of get up in the dark eat breakfast on my own and leave the house before most of the people are awake. And when one time one of my kids left their math book on the um, kitchen uh, dining table 
and I, I was eating my cereal or whatever I was having, I kind of opened it. And this is a high school math book, and it was interesting. It had two pages on differentials, two pages on exponentials, two pages on integration. I had no idea that mathematics came in two-page modules, okay? Every subject could be treated in two pages. It didn't make any sense to me. And then I realized all they're doing is prepping the students to take the SATs, okay? I thought, that's dumb. They should be teaching them math, okay, rather than prepping them. Because I know what they'd learn on those things. They would learn how to pass an SAT quiz, but they, would they know what an exponential was? No, okay. So I think that's sort of dumb, okay. Um, this subject is not required for anyone. Anyone have this as a requirement? It's an elective, right? The Navy students have it as a requirement. But that's the Naval Sea Systems Command does that. Um, and so if you're taking it, hopefully you're taking it for fun. Let's try to have fun, okay? Um, another thing is some professors like to build up their ego by telling you how complex the subject is and how brilliant they are. Well, I told you, I was in the bottom third of my entering class. I ain't that bright. I've known since I came here that most of the people at MIT are smarter than me, and therefore, I'm not going to try to show you up. I'm going to try to show you how you can simplify things, which is what I had to do to get through things, okay? <clears throat> um, I also used to say, I'm going to try to tell you what you already know and how to integrate it. I did a study once when I was department head for the School of Engineering, and we found that the, the faculty in the school, the department heads and center directors, thought that we only spent about 10% of our time teaching integration skills to the students, and we should be spending 30% of our time okay, teaching integration skills. So a lot of the stories are actually are trying to integrate economics and other things, okay? Um, and so far as that goes. Um, I will, I guess if you want, anybody have any questions? Um, I'm going to basically give you um, a brief outline of what the three modules we did live last spring and not everybody, when we do them live, we don't always get very many students. Um, uh, in the spring, we tend to have 40 or 50 students in the class. This is about the same size class. How many do we have? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, nineteen. Okay. So for whatever, the fall, fall semester is about half the size of the enrollment in the spring semester. Uh, that doesn't really matter. but. I decided to teach total quality management, and the reason I did is when I was department head in the 1990s, TQM was a big hot topic, um, and I was, most of the faculty in the School of Engineering didn't know much about it. A lot of the faculty at Sloan knew something about it because industry was, was big on it, and uh, so I had a bunch of undergraduates in the Chipman room, and I said, does anybody know what TQM is? And some student in the back says, it's bullshit. I said, okay, uh, you know, there's a lot of truth to that. But the CEOs of some of the top companies had issued a challenge to MIT and other six or seven elite universities, and we were paired with IBM, and about um, 75 MIT faculty, 7.5% of the MIT faculty, went and spent a whole week at the IBM Executive Training Center on the Hudson River. Beautiful facility. The cafeteria food was fantastic. It was a fancy motel without the swimming facilities. They did have the exercise facilities. But it turns out IBM was going to teach us total quality management because they felt it was so important. Uh, in fact, they called it customer driven quality. They had their own name for it. Uh, and it turns out uh, senior executive vice president of IBM which is probably one of the top three or four people in the company, gave the introduction. And Chuck Vest, the president of MIT, came out to say how important, important he thought this little exercise was. 
And it was interesting because it turns out we had probably 25 or 30 Sloan faculty, and the rest of them were mostly from the School of Engineering. But um, it turns out that the people from IBM during that week got up and they talked about these principles, some of which, guess what, the, the professors from Sloan or the School of Engineering had actually invented those principles, okay? They didn't know they were teaching to the teachers. Uh, but anyway, it was interesting. I remember IB, the guy from the senior executive vice president said, we used to have 410,000 employees at IBM, and through CDM, we've reduced it to 320,000 without getting rid of any direct labor reports. So they've gotten rid of 90,000 out of 200,000 managers. And he said, someone asked a question, and said, why did you do that? And he said, well, or why did you have so many managers? He said, well, we used to have a lot of people in place to try to keep big problems from rising up to the top. So a little bit later, I raised my hand to ask the question, well, since you got rid of 90, you know, half your people that were keeping the big problems from rising to the top, have you found more problems rising to the top? And he stopped and he thought, and he says, well, no, probably fewer. So they had 90,000 people doing negative value added. And they found that saved money when they got rid of them, OK? <clears throat> I mean, anyway. Um, so my theme in TQM was to present to the student, students what the TQM movement was, going back to the US Navy in the Thresher disaster and Admiral Rickover, and how it was, came out of necessity, OK? He didn't want to lose another submarine, um, and how it spread first to Japan and the Toyota system, and then finally to the United States, uh, and things like that. And then at the end, let the students try to decide. I told them what some of the tools were. Did you know they, can, they taught you how to draw pie charts in TQM? Woo! OK, but they taught some other things that are very valuable, OK? Statistical process control and other things. There are good parts of TQM, but the first response of the student that some of it's bullshit is absolutely correct. But in fact, it's not all bullshit. And so hopefully, the students were able to sort out the fact from the fiction. Simone Belmar basically has started a, a company called MMT that does on-site evaluation of pipelines for mechanical properties. This is a little scratch tester, and they can measure the tensile strength of the steel, hope to be able to measure the fracture toughness. He got, he's gotten about $1.2 million out of the NSF. SBIR program, NSF requires if you get money, you have to go attend some workshops taught by people from industry who would started their own businesses. So Simone basically went through, and he covers that, and he had a lot of students really like that. Has nothing to do with structural materials per se, has to do starting up a business. Steve Lyons, intellectual property and the law, um, how to become conversant on how law and technology interface. Um, what does it mean to get an, um, what is IP, what's the copyright, trademark, trademark and patent law. Uh, and he had some guest speakers come in. Some of the top patent attorneys from Boston came and gives, gave some guest lectures. Okay, so philosophy is keep it simple. Um, and you've all heard Occam's razor, or, which is keep it simple. Or some people call it keep it simple stupid, kiss, the kiss person. Principle. In fact, Occam, the Earl of Occam, said in Latin, that's what he said, okay, it is futile to do with more things that can be done with fewer. I'm not sure he was following his principle there, okay? Um, but anyway, um, <clears throat> teaching success. Uh, I've already told you, you can only cover one or two concepts in an hour, all the rest of the stuff is fluff, okay? Um, uh, numerical results are easier to grade than conceptual ex expositions. That's why in the School of Engineering you get nice simple little problems like this. The professor all he has to do is check off, did you get the same number that he got, uh, rather than something that's some exposition that he has to read, okay? Uh, so um, You've all been in classes, engineering classes, where the professor spends a whole hour doing a derivation, right? And they screw it up invariably, right? Did you ever stop to think about why a professor would do that? It's a very simple answer. 
they didn't have time to prepare a lecture, okay? I learned this in my first year, or second semester on the faculty. I had been on travel. I was teaching a course in deformation processing. I really hadn't, I wasn't prepared for the lecture uh, that morning. And I looked in the book, and there was a derivation. Aha! I could do the derivation in class. And then all of a sudden, the light went off. I thought, oh, that's why they do it. And I went to class, I did the derivation, screwed it up, I'm sure. And I promised myself I would never do a derivation in class again. And I haven't, OK? If a derivation needs to be written out, I'll write it out, Xerox it, give it to the students. You're smart enough to follow the math on your own. And we would just discuss what the derivation means, what the result means, OK? Uh, so doing a derivation in class, if they pull that one on you, you now know what it's all about. Now, communications, which I'm not going to have a lot of time to go over. Uh, there's a guy, Edward Tufta, who was a professor at Yale, and he started, he wrote four books on communications. And he said, uh, fuzzy writing is usually the result of fuzzy thinking. And so, um, also on Stellar, you'll find an article on the cognitive style of PowerPoint by Tufta. He hates PowerPoint. He despises PowerPoint. However, there are some advantages to PowerPoint. Uh, you're going to find that he did uh, the Gettysburg Address in PowerPoint. Okay? You want to see a great piece of English literature turned into pure drivel? You use Auto Content Wizard to do PowerPoint. So you can look at that. Uh, he tells the story of Lou Gerstner became the CEO of IBM when IBM was having some serious problems. And so on Lou Gerstner's first day, first of all, he couldn't get in the building. He didn't have an ID, sort of a catch-22. Couldn't get an ID until he got in the building, but he didn't have an ID, so they wouldn't let him in the building. So here's the CEO of this 400,000 400, employee uh, company who couldn't get in the building. When they finally had someone come down and overrule the security guard, he got in the building. He had some meetings with some of the top executives to find out what's going on at IBM. And they all got up to do their PowerPoints, right? And after about 15 or 20 minutes, he went up. He turned off the overhead projector. He says, let's just talk about your business. Well, emails went around IBM within five minutes about how Lou Gerstner had turned off the PowerPoints. And they didn't have PowerPoint. Anyway, the story's in, in there. Um, too many people use PowerPoints as a crutch. There is an article on why the World Trade Center collapse. Uh, I give you this because it's an article I wrote. I started writing it. I was asked three weeks after the World Trade Center collapsed by the editor of a metallurgical journal if I would write something. And I was so sick of hearing all the false, fake news, I guess is the term today, right? Uh, falsehoods that were being put out in the press. I said, OK, I'll write an article. I spent three hours with the help of a, a student writing this article. I really didn't know much of anything about the World Trade Center. But I knew some chemistry, and I knew some physics, and I had done some fire investigations. And so I just talked about what I knew and what the scientific principles were. And I also knew, remember fuzzy writing um, is a result of fuzzy thinking. I knew I was going to pitch it to a high school science student. That was the level. Well, this came out in December after the September 11th. And within a month, all of a sudden, there were websites out against me. I was just a shill for the government because the government had actually brought down the World Trade Centers. It was actually a way to get uh, the Arabs upset with the Jews. and. Uh, they said that I should, they were writing to the president of MIT saying I should lose my tenure, and it was just wonderful, okay? And for the next nine years, if you hit WTC collapse on Google, I was the number one hit. And all of a sudden, I'd go to Washington, and people say, well, you're the expert on the World Trade Center collapse. I thought, hmm. I spent three hours writing that paper, less time than any paper I've ever written, and I've gotten more comments. I still get comments from wackos, okay? 
about the World Trade Center, okay? There's a couple of others. One is the future of metals. It's something I wrote 25 years ago to try to bring material scientists back to uh, reality. There were people saying, oh, metals are dead. Well, not exactly, okay? Uh, and so that has to do with structural materials, strangely enough. And this other one, I was on a National Research Council Committee for Materials Research for Defense Needs, and it turns out we all have to write something. So I wrote up, I took my structural materials course, the one that you could take if you wanted, if you're interested, and I kind of summarized it in four or five pages. And this was my contribution. Well, it didn't fit any of the other people. They were interested in nano this and bio that and stuff. Well, my paper didn't make any sense, so they put it as an appendix, okay? Uh, they don't attribute it to me, okay? Uh, but it is, if you want to, if you're interested in structural materials, you could just read that and save yourself the trouble of watching all the lectures. Okay, any questions? So tomorrow, Dr. Belmar will be here. Um, so far as that goes, and he will do his little intro for his modules and stuff, but you should start looking at the website and figuring out what modules you want to watch, okay? And I'll see you, I'll see you again on Monday, okay? If you want to come, but you don't have to, because there's no quizzes. Okay, thanks.